So we're recording. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the first of, uh, of what will likely be many episodes of, uh, of our little RadVac podcast. Um, my name is Alex Hoekstra. I am one of the co-founders of RadVac. I am, uh, I'm joined by Dr. Preston Estep, Brian Delaney, and Ranjan Ahuja, uh, who are all uh, on the core team and, and co-founders uh, of the Rapid Deployment Vaccine Collaborative, which is RadVac. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Great to be here for yeah, our first episode. This is wonderful. Yeah. So, you know, I think the, the intention for this first episode is really to introduce RADVAC as, uh, as an organization and as a project, um, and to, to discuss kind of the, the, the why, uh, and the what, right, of, of our organization and of the RADVAC project. Um, you know, we uh, we came together at the the very beginning, even um, by some by some metrics before the beginning of the uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, we've been working for the last twenty months. Uh, right now, it's mid December twenty twenty one, so I think I think that's about twenty months um, in. And uh, I think it's it's important that uh, that people really have a clear picture of what we do and why we do it, um, because. We haven't we haven't done a lot of public communication by ourselves. We've um, we've been in the press a number of times. People have written about us, um, but this is maybe our first opportunity to really speak for ourselves. Um, so I'm excited to do that, and uh, I know we have a lot to to cover. I know our our uh, our project has um, you know multiple facets that are uh, important and and potentially very disruptive. Um, and highly technical. And um, I think in future episodes, we'll get into those technicalities. We'll get into uh, perhaps mucosal immunity. We'll get into uh, different sort of platforms for uh, vaccines. Uh, we'll get into potentially the economics of, uh, of vaccinology and, and you know, some potential ways of, of rethinking and, and restructuring those economics to, uh, to do better in the future. But um, again, for today, I think the, the goal here is to introduce ourselves um, and to give everyone kind of a clear picture of who we are and uh, what, we, what we're all about. So, um, you know, I, I, I want to give everyone a chance to introduce themselves. So, so Dr. Isep, please uh, give, us, give us a little background on you. So my uh, scientific background is in, is in genetics and genome science. Uh, I've uh, started a, a quite a few um, Omics related startup companies and uh, and, uh, and and related computing efforts. Um, uh, I'm also uh, I've been involved in nonprofits uh, because uh, the best way to solve certain problems isn't always through a company structure. So I've uh, I've focused a lot on uh, on the nonprofit space, including the Harvard Personal Genome Project, where many of us met uh, initially. And um, uh, I, uh, I knew very little about, the, uh, uh, about vaccinology, about the technical side of vaccinology at the beginning of the pandemic, um, and uh, decided that, that uh, because of, uh, of the very long and, and, uh, and problematic wait that was envisioned at the beginning of the pandemic, that I should learn vaccinology as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible so that, uh, so that we could become um, self-empowered to, uh, to help um, ourselves and our loved ones to, uh, to weather the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously the project has grown uh, you know, far beyond the scope of, of simply helping ourselves and our loved ones and uh, you know, hopefully that, that what we do becomes a highly leverageable facet of a, a larger vaccinology ecosystem. Thank you. Ranjan, do you want to go next? Sure, thanks. I'm Ranjan Lehuja. I uh, also have a background in biology, environmental science, ecology, uh, but in the last several years, as, uh, as mentioned, got involved in you know, open science, uh, working on the personal genome project also. And uh, that was quite uh, an amazing uh, find for me, or an amazing match, because it it uh, made me realize that there was an entire community out there of people who were uh, and are deeply committed to 
open science uh, and to citizen science and other related uh, ideals. So, you know, at the time of the pandemic, I was also looking around, you know, in semi panic as, as I think a lot of us were wondering what the heck was going on, this unprecedented event in, in human, uh, recent human history and uh, wondering what we could do about it. And, uh, you know, RADVAC was uh, a wonderful extension of the same principles uh, under which I've been operating uh, on you know, the BGP. And uh, uh, although it is a very distinct project and very different in a lot of ways, uh, really applied a lot of the same strengths uh, and, and ideals to, uh, to solving you know, the vaccine issue, not just for SARS-CoV-2, but for uh, vaccinology, and, uh, vaccinology in general. So I'm um, very excited to, uh, to share, uh, you know, our, our perspectives with everybody about the project and what we can do going forward. Yeah, thank you. All right, Brian, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Brian Delaney, and I've um, started a number of nonprofits connected to health, and in particular longevity, uh, going back to the CRS Society, which was founded, co-founded with some others in 1992. The Calorie Restriction Society is the full name. And these nonprofits are typically uh, focused on longevity, and above all, uh, increasingly in recent years, mind span, a term that appears in Preston Eastep's book, The Mind Span Diet. Um, but when the pandemic struck, I realized like a lot of people who focus on longevity and they think about how they're going to eat and what vitamins they are going to take and whether or not they're going to take metformin. If you forget to wear your seatbelt and you die in a car accident, then what's the point of going to all the effort to try to live longer? Well, likewise, if you get struck down by SARS-CoV-2, then it, that, that be, proves to be the weakest link in a chain of things you have to do to live longer. So... So that's when I got thinking that I wanted to try to think through how we could solve the pandemic. And RADVAC was a way to make a dent in this pandemic, but also prepare for future pandemics. And more broadly, Ron John uh, articulated this quite well. It's, it's a different way of doing science that can apply to things far beyond pandemics and vaccinology. Uh, this, this sharing of data, uh, open source science, so that's why uh, RADVAC is particularly important to me. We, we can, it, it's a way to respond rapidly to the current pandemic. Um, pursuing RADVAC can put in place infrastructure around the world to be able to respond to new pandemics and even to jumpstart biotech sectors and parts of the world that don't have them, make certain parts of the world that are currently dependent on other parts of the world for things vaccines and all kinds of medicines um, more independent. So that's that's really, I think, very briefly sums up my interest in RADVAC. Yeah, yeah I think, um, uh, I guess I should probably introduce myself too. Uh, I'm Alex Hooks, I'm a molecular biologist and I, I echo all of those sentiments, right? I think that, um, you know, all of us here uh, come from kind of a, a background of um, valuing openness and transparency in science and information. Um, and, and seeing kind of the unique leverageability in science as the root of innovation, right? I think, um, you know, those principles manifest themselves, you know, continuously as we, as we continue the RADVAC project. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we can get in future episodes, we can get into kind of the, you know, the incentives of vaccinology and ways that, uh, that we, can, we can better leverage, uh, you know, open science to be uh, a driver of innovation around the world. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm excited to, uh, to, to be a part of the project. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's an amazing new way of thinking about and, uh, and ultimately achieving uh, success in vaccinology, which um, has been an underdeveloped, a woefully underdeveloped uh, science for, for a number of years. Not to say that it hasn't um, gone through you know, some, some incredible progress, uh, but ultimately that uh, more innovation is needed. More innovation has been needed for um, for multiple decades, um, and uh, hopefully we can inspire some of that innovation uh, going forward. So, um, with with all that said, I'd love for us to kind of get into you know what is RADVAC? Uh, what 
what defines us, what sets us apart from traditional vaccine development or, or kind of conventional vaccine development uh, in the in the pre-COVID era and even in the in the mid-COVID era. What uh, what sets Radvac apart from say a a Moderna or a Pfizer or BioNTech uh, or or any of the other sort of conventional vaccine developers? Well, so uh, before we get really deep into any details or, or uh, you know any defining features, let's just say what our mission statement is. Sure. Our mission is to expand access. It's just really that simple. Uh, above all, at the beginning of an outbreak when uh, when there aren't any vaccines, right? Um, so, and vaccine access uh, continues to be a problem. Um, even it, it's going to continue to be a problem probably through the end of 2022 for many countries. So, so access is what we're, what we're all about. It, it defines everything that we do. Um, people often complain about inequality, but really access is the sort of key word that they're looking for um, rather than, than equity or equality because there was perfect equity or perfect equality at the beginning of the pandemic when nobody had vaccines, right? So we don't want to go back to that. We don't want to have a situation where everyone's equal and a complete lack of access to vaccines. We want to maximize access to vaccines. And so um, some defining attributes of, of RADVAC or just you know, key words are speed or alacrity. We can produce vaccines in a few weeks. Uh, and, but, but, you know, so can uh, Moderna, right? They can make a vaccine in a few weeks. So a key, really critical difference is that we're independent. A lot, the self-production and self-administration of a vaccine, they don't require FDA or re other regulatory approval and allow us to move really quickly and efficiently. Um, so uh, you don't, uh, and, and technically, you know, that doesn't help you unless the vaccine is really very simple to produce. So one of the goals that we've um, uh, sought from the very, very beginning of the design of RADVAC was, uh, to, was to make a, a creative vaccine platform that was simple enough so that a non-expert could produce it uh, without, uh, you know, extensive um, equipment or laboratory skills or background. So we tried to you know, simplify the overall process down to the level of the you know, recipes and home cookbooks. And I think that, you know, we've achieved that. So even though the, the, uh, the vaccine platform itself is incredibly technically advanced and based in the literature, in the scientific literature, um, it's the equivalent, you know, of, a, of an iPhone. Um, uh, you don't have to be a, a uh, you know, an iPhone developer or manufacturer to be able to use an iPhone. So we've, we've had a similar goal in empowering people uh, to, to be able to, you know, make and take this vaccine themselves without actually uh, being able to uh, understand all of the complex science that goes into, uh, you know, the, the creation of this vaccine platform. I think one of the, one of the most important, one of the driving, you know, components of access to vaccines is access to the production, access to the development, access to the upstream components of vaccinology um, that are kind of necessary in order to, to access a vaccine. Because, you know, our, our current model, uh, the current working model in uh, certainly for COVID-19 vaccines and, and really, you know, throughout history has been kind of a trickle down model of, you know, access provided from, from high income nations uh, and, and otherwise, you know, filtering through multiple layers of trickling down logistically. Here we, we conceptualize a project that is simple enough, accessible enough to not just produce, but actually to, to develop, right? Um, you know, we talked about, um, you know, not everyone has to be sophisticated enough to make their own iPhone, um, but the iPhone uh, and, and Android and, and, you know, multiple other kind of operating system uh, and hardware components that, that exist and have become massively distributed create a, a kind of developer ecosystem as well, right? And we've seen a huge diversification of applications, a huge diversification of new tools uh, that leverage that, that core technology that they didn't have to invent themselves. Not everyone has to reinvent the, uh, the wheel. So, you know, we, I think, uh, you know, by, by releasing 
vaccinology tools into the open source, right? By releasing um, kind of these, these modular components of vaccines and vaccine candidates, uh, and even, even you know, uh, preclinical and clinical trialing considerations and standards for that. Um, we are, we're creating leverageable components that, that can be used to, uh, you know, to, to encourage a developer ecosystem to take things and run with them, right? To, uh, to begin with workable components and actually fork them into to new directions, potentially new diseases or adjuvants or, um, you know, new antigenic targets. So, um, so yeah, uh, that, that independence, that, that sort of, um, empowerment of, uh, of, of individuals around the world. Um, and that, that could be on the individual level, but it, it really could also be on the, um, the organizational level, right? Independent organizations, universities, or even companies around the world can, can pick up these tools and, uh, and begin to, to, to develop vaccines in a new way. Um, so I think that's maybe a, uh, a really exciting and unique component of, of what Radvac is doing. And so I just want to interject mm -hmm. real quickly, you know, when people hear about what we're doing that we're making and taking our own vaccines, a lot of people are, you know, characterize that as, as radical. You know, I think the, the rad and Radvac is radical. It's not, it's not radical. It's, ra it's rapid. You know, we want to, you know, we want to emphasize that what we're doing really is uh, we're drawing on the, the oldest and deepest traditions in, in, in vaccine science going back to you know even before vac vaccination was a word before it was a concept uh people tested these things on themselves they uh people you know physicians and, and scientists tested various kind of therapeutic candidates on themselves including uh pre-vaccines and variolation and, and actual true vaccines they were testing these things on themselves so so what we're doing isn't that radical. It's really, you know, very conservative. It's very traditional. What we've done that is is sort of radical is to freshen that up by sharing all of our uh, knowledge, all of our uh, information about protocols, self-administration, vaccine production. We share all that freely and openly on the internet uh, in, in a very similar way to. Uh, to the Linux project or other free and open source software projects. And even, even if I remembering right, even in the, uh, you know, more modern vaccine development, right. Even in uh, COVID-19 vaccine development, there were, you know, um, uh, there were instances of, of self-administration, self-experimentation, um, but they just weren't sort of shared, right. That, that ability to, uh, to experiment with vaccines was not a, a shared uh, sort of ability. Um, it was only for the select few. It was only for, for those uh, in positions of, of knowledge and, and power. That's um, right. Yeah. So it's. Um, so it's an, it was an elitist undertaking, you know. And so if we had if we had made these vaccines for ourselves and then not shared that information, that would have actually been more the traditional elitist model. But you know, uh, we don't think that that's actually extremely productive. It might have protected us, but. It's, it's better, it's more productive, it's more uh, effective um, as a model if, if we share everything and then other people can use it and give us feedback and share forward any information uh, that, that, um, that they think is useful. Now, ultimately, the project was really driven by need and compassion. You know, everyone around the world uh, was thinking what in a situation, what, what can I do? What can we do? And we have a particular skill set which allowed us to work in this space. Uh, and we saw what was going on around us and saw what was happening with not only people that we know and love, but uh, with the world. And, and we're just like everybody else. You know, everybody has family, everyone has friends, everyone has communities. Um, and we needed to make an impact. Uh, you know, for everyone. And using the word access as a jumping off point, uh, you know, to, to, to discuss that a little bit further, uh, as we've seen in this pandemic unfolding, is that no one is safe until everyone's safe, which is a sort of, you know, natural justice, if you will, when it comes to this interconnected world in which we live. Uh, we can, we've seen the uh, emergence of variants and the fact that 
even though certain countries maybe have, have, have very high rates of vaccination, variants will always continue to emerge in those parts of the world which are unvaccinated or have low rates of vaccination because the unvaccinated status uh, or non-immune status, if you want to put it that way, uh, allows for a faster emergence of variants. And so access is important uh, in that way as well. You know, one thing, one thing I loved um, about, about RADVAC from the beginning when I joined was that, um, you know, the, the, the idea was that we were hoping that people would look at the design and be able to make this and, you know, ideally trial it and share information. But um, ideally, we would have people who would read our white paper where we describe the vaccine design and understand it well enough that they can actually modify it that they can come up with other variations on it, just exactly like with Linux. Um, and that happened from the very beginning. And we don't, it, probably more than we even know. I'm sure there are plenty of chemists out there who just thought, well, I'll use a different adjuvant or tweak the amount of peptide epitopes in the formulation. But we were contacted by a number of groups that actually modified the uh, vaccine design a bit to, to try to improve it or maybe apply it in a different way. So that was kind of a dream come true that we're, this is, this really is open science. We are, we are, producing uh, white papers with designs for vaccines that aren't just instructions. I mean, the, the, the home cooking analogy is, is really appropriate here because it is really easy to make, but it's also science. And if you really understand the white paper enough, the technical background, um, you can actually modify the design. So you can, you can take the pancake recipe and you know, add some blueberries and see what it'll do. And lots of people are doing that. Uh, that that's a really important point that Brian makes because that feedback that we got from those groups actually uh, helped us to make better vaccines. So we 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 made improvements. We made some you know, multiple improvements based on information that we were getting from other groups. Right, and and, and you know it speaks to kind of the. Uh the accuracy or maybe the power of the, the Linux metaphor, right? That, uh, you know, the, the Linux developer ecosystem uh, helped empower Linux to grow from a single iteration, a single project, uh, you know, a single sort of set of code into this, this you know, massive ecosystem of, um, you know, Linux kernel driven applications and, and software that have, have kind of become infrastructural, you know, to the modern digital world. Um, I, I think most people probably don't, don't understand or, or maybe don't don't realize sort of the the reach of Linux or the the integral nature of of Linux kernels and of open source uh, uh, software in kind of uh, cybersecurity and and all things digital at this point. But you know the idea here being that um, you know mass accessibility and and simplicity in terms of their ability to contribute, their ability to participate um, in development uh, has has you know rapidly massively incentivized and, uh, and, and ultimately driven innovation in the, in the digital, digital world. Uh, well, I, I, I don't mm -hmm. think that, uh, that many people do realize that the, you know, the incredible um, spread uh, of Linux and, they, and the, the massive foundation that it has been used to create for the entire internet. And, uh, and that was done through the power of open source, free and open source di distributed sharing and distributed contributions by countless developers who were able to get under the hood and, you know, and, and, and tweak and make, make, you know, changes to the code, uh, very similar to the way that, that um, we designed Radvac. You know, I, if you took away Linux from the, you know, from the, the uh, global computing ecosystem, you know, everybody's, it's, Almost everybody's smartphone would stop working. It, you know, everybody's well, well, feeds would stop working. Everybody's, right. you know, kitten and porn videos would <laughs> stop streaming. Well, well, and, and, and planes, planes would fall out of the sky. I mean, planes would fall yeah. out of the sky. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. Civilization basically would come to a halt. That's right. Yeah. So you know, we've we've conceptualized you know our work uh, in different ways. Obviously, you know, the white paper is kind of this this foundational. You know, knowledge hub, this resource of knowledge um, that we've we've sometimes considered kind of a, a you know the vaccinology equivalent of a software developer kit, right? Like a an SDK is something that the software developers can use to iterate on, right? They they use this to develop new applications that do new things, 
based on this core set of, of uh, uh, code structure and, and code libraries. And um, again, without having to reinvent their, their wheel, uh, they're able to develop new, uh, new applications on a platform. So similarly, you know, the white paper, that, that, uh, the multiple white papers that we've, we've released through RADVAC um, contain those, those sort of fundamentally iterable, uh, adaptable, modular kind of components where we give people the power to, to grow this technology in different directions that, uh, and, and in that way, decentralize it, right? That, uh, you know, multiple people have actually forked the white paper. Um, and I, I don't know to what extent they've, they've continued those forks, but, you know, I look at that and, and as a great thing, right? I look at that as, as the project outgrowing, um, you know, kind of a, a central, um, you know, central point of failure, right? If anything should happen to one of us, um, uh, you know, or anything happens to our server, we have, we have, uh, you know, a, a freestanding or, or um, you know, anti-fragile kind of network of knowledge uh, that, that is capable of expanding on its own. I think that's, that's pretty exciting. So, so why don't we take this up to, a, you know, back up to a slightly, slightly higher level before we get deeper again. Um, people ask us, you know, really basic questions about what we're trying to do and who we are, and they make assumptions about us and what we're, you know, what we've done. First of all, they think that we're brave. If you know that we've taken on this, this crazy demonstration, this proof of principle, you know, risking our lives to do it. And it's just, we, we, we've got to make it really clear right up front that we are not that brave. This is not about bravery versus cowardice. This is about a simple risk calculation based on the history of the safety of vaccines. It's simple as that. Vaccines are incredibly safe. They're the safest class of therapeutic. They have the highest probability of success of any therapeutic class. The, uh, the, the sort of darkest days of vaccines that public health officials often talk about when they try to scare you about vaccines it, are, very, are actually not very dark at all relative to the darkness of SARS-CoV-2. They talk about uh, polio vaccines from the 1950s. They talk about uh, respiratory syncytial virus vaccines in the 1960s. The total number of deaths for all those vaccines that, you know, the worst vaccine uh, mishaps in the history of science, you know, is about a dozen deaths, you know, which at the peak of the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic, you know, we're talking about a dozen every minute. So uh, vaccines are phenomenally safe. And, uh, we, you know, we can, we, we, we strangely, uh, Radvac strangely uh, attracts a lot of people who are vaccine hesitant or opposed to vaccines. But that's one of the first points that we try to clarify for people is that we do, we do what we do and we've done the work that we've done because we believe in the safety of vaccines very generally, not just in our platform, but uh, we've all taken you know, multiple commercial vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. We've all taken dozens of other vaccines for various things, you know, measles, mumps, rubella, you know, on and on and on, tetanus. Um, vaccines are fantastically safe and they're the most effective uh, therapeutic intervention ever devised by humanity. They've, they've saved more lives than any other type of therapy. So we're just, you know, we're not brave. We're not risking ourselves. We're just trusting in the history of the vaccine science that tells us that vaccines are fantastically safe, not perfectly safe, but relative to SARS-CoV-2 or other dangerous pathogen, extremely safe. And I think it's important that we come at that from, you know, we were able to come at that from kind of a, a, a mechanistic level, right? We were able to look at kind of the, the mechanics of immunology, the mechanics of vaccinology um, versus the mechanics of the pathology of viruses and, and make that kind of risk calculation. Um, and see that it, it very clearly favors intervention, right? It favors prevention uh, as opposed to simply waiting um, for intervention, you know, that might come down the line, right? Interventions from, um, you know, commercial vaccines undergoing their, their process of, 
um, you know, regulatory approval and, and oversight. And at the beginning of this pandemic, it was estimated that, you know, it would be a 12 to 18 month process. Um, and that, that wait time, that lag time uh, would and has um, meant a, a, a catastrophic kind of amount of death. And, and that for us was not tenable. That for us was not tolerable. That's right. And it still isn't. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, it's important also to, to, to kind of bring up, um, you know, the, the broad conceptualization and misconception, mischaracterization of RADVAC uh, in relation to the FDA, right? So, um, you know, I think a lot of people uh, have assumed or anticipated that, that RADVAC is anti-FDA. Um, do we want to talk a little bit about how, you know, how we conceptualize kind of the authoritative, uh, you know, infrastructure there and, and what our position is? We are not FDA, anti-FDA. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> which, 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 doesn't mean, which doesn't mean we agree with all their decisions, of course, but um, we, it's good to have a regulatory body that, that you know, that, that can keep people safe. But it, it might be an improvement if regulatory bodies thought a little bit more carefully about the consequences of waiting to grant access to new medicines. Although I, I, I can't, I can't say that they don't. Um, they, in, in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, they have the hardest job in the world, right? Um, they are dealing with a, uh, a highly irrational public, right? Even with the, yeah. the 12 to 18 month delay that, that they, they did build into the regulatory process, Many, many people at the end of that period still said they don't trust vaccines because they were developed and, and, and approved in record time, right? So the, the FDA is having to deal with this incredibly high level of irrational hesitancy. And so they need to, that, you know, that's baked into the decisions they have to make. I can't say that I would have done anything different if I was the head of the FDA because you can't please everyone. You can't, there's a spectrum of the population. You know, they are trying to, to deal with a public health emergency, not just create you know, or, or, or regulate or approve a safe and effective vaccine. They're trying to do it in a way that, that engenders trust with people who fundamentally don't trust. And so, that's part of the complex calculation that they're having to deal with. I, I, I agree completely. I think it's up to the politicians who actually you know, select the members of, of FDA and its ancillary committees to lead and to actually change public views of vaccines. I think one thing that would or be- for other, Or for other people to lead, right? Like us. Which, like, like RADVAC. Like RADVAC, yeah. 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 When, 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 when that other model has failed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, I, well, one thing I'd love to see is a, a rethinking of the bioethics about the trialing of vaccines. And this is something I think the FDA would be open to, a model of extremely highly informed consent that would permit people, again, extremely informed consent, permit people to get access under a kind of trial registry to experimental vaccines a little bit earlier under the condition a lot earlier oh uh, yeah exactly as early as right. possible as early as possible G give them the choice absolutely we've we've talked uh internally a lot about you know the the power that a, a volunteer vaccine core would have right in reducing the time to uh to recruit for massive uh, clinical trial i mean that recruitment time is a is a massive lag uh, in in clinical trialing, which you know itself is is chock full of lags, but um, the recruitment process is due for an upgrade, right? It's due for an uh, an overhaul, uh, and one of the one of the sort of key innovations that might help reduce that lag time is a, a vaccine volunteer core that is hopefully diverse enough to um, you know to represent the population well enough in a clinical trial that it actually has utility for you know a real world population that is diverse outside of the clinical trial 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to make I want to make one important point that I don't think we've made yet. Um, that uh, that some people might be a little bit perplexed about the the you know our approach to the self administration of vaccines. We're not injecting a needle, you know, into ourselves. So when when you hear about self administration from Radvac, you know, it sounds pretty radical, but we're talking about a nasal vaccine where you it's simply like a nasal spray where you just you spray it up your nose and you, you inhale as you, as you spray it up your nose. It's that simple. So it doesn't involve needles. Um, and it doesn't involve, you know, high levels of sterility of the needle and, you know, uh, possibly contaminating uh, uh, or injecting yourself with a contaminated vaccine. So uh, uh, when, when I, I mentioned to George Church, one of our, our other co-founders, a professor of Harvard Medical School, um, that we were making a nasal vaccine. He was really excited about it. And uh, he thought that uh, nasal vaccines were, were badly underrepresented in, the, in the, uh, the initial batch of vaccines that were being made against SARS-CoV-2. And uh, when, when he told me that a reporter had asked him about um, whether or not he's concerned about the sterility of our vaccines. He said, well, if there's, if there's some contaminant in there, it will have uh, ample company up my nose. <laughs> because the, the nose is not a sterile environment to begin with, but that's how people can make these vaccines in their kitchens uh, without uh, you know, extreme concern about uh, you know, making this uh, in, in, in an environment very like a, the, uh, the, the high sterility environment of, a, you know, inside of a vac normal vaccine factory. If you make a, a nasal vaccine with, uh, with some, you know, a few bacteria here and there, it's not going to make a difference because your, your, your nasal passages are already loaded with those things. Yeah. We do, though, we do uh, account for in our production protocols uh, sterilization of all of the, um, the, the components of the vaccine so that you don't inadvertently uh, infect yourself with uh, SARS-CoV-2 while you're taking the vaccine. But otherwise, um, it, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a point of, uh, of, uh, that, that one should be extremely concerned about. But I think there's, there's also a, a key point in, in intranasal vaccine. I mean, there's a lot to talk about in intranasal vaccines that I think will We'll probably dedicate a future, you know, whole session on intranasal vaccines and, uh, you know, both the, the challenges and the, the sort of unique opportunities that uh, exist for intranasal vaccines. But um, it's true that, that you know, uh, it is a, a very underrepresented and, and uh, you know, underutilized technology in, in vaccinology. And I, I wonder if it's, uh, if it's worth kind of addressing very quickly why that is. Um, and uh, and how we how we at Radvac you know envision sort of overcoming that and, and bringing it into kind of the mainstream uh, public health tool. Right. So we we uh, we chose vaccines um, for a, a number of properties. You know, uh, uh, there there were there, there, the the vaccine research literature is full of fantastic uh, uh, research. Uh, on a variety of different kinds of vaccines, but um, uh, nasal vaccine self-administration was sort of a defining feature of, you know, of, a, a, uh, of, of allowing us to safely administer vaccines. But it also uh, comes with this incredible advantage in um, uh, providing immunity to the kind of pathogen that SARS-CoV-2 is. It's a respiratory virus and all respiratory viruses enter the body through the mucosal surfaces, either in the nose or, or the mouth of the lungs. And um, it turns out uh, that there are two very different kinds of immunity in the body. There's systemic immunity uh, in the bloodstream. And you, you, when you get a, a shot uh, uh, of a vaccine, you stimulate uh, your systemic immunity. And it's there's specific kinds of antibodies and specific kinds of cells that um, that uh, create a, a layer of systemic immunity. Um, but then there's a separable type of immunity in the mucosal surfaces in, in your nasal passages and your lungs. 
um, called called mucosal immunity, and um, that's defined by different kinds of antibodies, different kinds of uh, immune cells, and um, you can induce systemic immunity with a nasal vaccine, but you generally cannot induce uh, mucosal immunity with an injected vaccine. So it's really important uh, when you're, um, when the, the primary pathogen that you're battling is a respiratory virus that, uh, that you have a way of, of uh, creating a, 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 mucosal immunity, because that actually prevents infection and spread of the pathogen, not simply uh, protection against a serious disease. So the commercial vaccines that we've got now, um, here in the U.S., the, the Moderna, Pfizer, uh, and, uh, and uh, Johnson & Johnson, the injectable vaccines create some level of systemic immunity, but uh, even just a few months after um, a booster, or in the case of Johnson Johnson, the, the, the initial vaccination, you can become infected, you can infect other people, even though you're protected against disease, whereas with a good mucosal vaccine, you are actually completely protected with a, you know, a good high level of, of uh, mucosal immunity. You're, you're protected against initial infection and therefore against spreading the virus. You know, the, the, other, the other great thing about um, intranasal vaccines is that there is a significant proportion of people who are vaccine hesitant, who are vaccine hesitant simply because of the needle. They're the people who worry about the CIA tracking chips. I mean, there are, there are all kinds of reasons why people might be concerned about vaccines, but, but a significant proportion, studies have shown it's at least a third in, in some parts of the world, it's, it's even higher in India apparently, who are um, hesitant only or primarily because they don't want to be jabbed with a needle. Um, so given that vaccine hesitancy is one of the primary reasons why the pandemic hasn't ended, or it hasn't become a relatively safe endemic, endemic uh, situation. Um, it's enormously important to have effective intranasal vaccines. Yeah, I think there's, there's also maybe a point here to be made uh, very quickly, of course, about um, the ability for self-administration, right? And, and right. With, with boosting, um, with the, the sort of necessity of, of updates as, uh, as as viruses evolve and uh, and as this pandemic drags on, um, you know the need for boosting has become clear. Um, uh, compliance for booster regimens, compliance for you know booster schedules, um, is very threatened by um, you know by the the need to book appointments, the need to uh, you know sort of coordinate with uh, care providers. Um, and, and ultimately, also needle hesitancy, where you have to to go and get jabbed once again. Um, you know, I think there's a, a again an opportunity for intranasal vaccines to solve some of these issues, um, potentially through self administration. Uh, imagine, yeah, Alex, you know, that, that that's yeah. a really good point. In fact, I remember um, being surprised, although I shouldn't have been, by how slow at the beginning of the vaccine rollout in the U.S. how slow uptake was and there were all these vaccine doses and they were distributed that that took a little bit of time but they were distributed but but one of the bottlenecks turned out to be the expertise i, I kind of want to put that in scare quotes but but it really does require training to, to administer these vaccines that was it that was a significant bottleneck um, at the beginning of the vaccine rollout in, in the us and i think in plenty of other developed countries so with the intranasal vaccine it's really simple I mean, I've, I basically it, the, the instructions can be given, you know, on your cell phone in four or five sentences. I mean, it's really simple. So the first dose and the boosters, all that I think can be can be done by people on their own or parents giving it to their children really easily, and that's a that's a big plus. So how then um, do you envision that Radvax proof of principle work fits into the larger system? Right, that fits into the larger sort of infrastructure of vaccine development. What is what is the the way of um, having an effect? What is it that we're contributing to that larger ecosystem um, 
obviously for, for SARS-CoV-2, for COVID-19, uh, but, but also going forward. Well, we will, uh, we will continue to, to, uh, to make proof of principle demonstrations, continue to saw, uh, share all that information uh, about um, uh, outbreaks, about the, the, the viruses and the vaccines that, that, that uh, the vaccines that we make in response to those viral outbreaks. So it's, um, uh, it's a long, difficult battle uh, you know, where we, we have to make many of these proofs of principle, uh, but we're also going to be engaging, uh, we're, we're also trying to create scalable infrastructures by helping to build uh, companies uh, that, can, that can leverage uh, the platform and the information learned from the RADVAC project so that they can eventually start to produce vaccines uh, more efficiently at rapidly safer vaccines, you know, turnkey vaccines, vaccine, you know, create a, the, the, the goal is to create a vaccine platform that basically just works every time you make a vaccine. Um, that, that's a, that, you know, that's a, that's been a goal in vaccinology and, and, uh, and, and um, pharma, you know, forever. But, uh, Unfortunately, we're not there probably with mRNA. mRNA, you know, worked for SARS-CoV-2, appears to not be working as well for certain other diseases. But I think eventually we will get there. We'll, we'll understand well enough, you know, what the, uh, what the challenges are for each pathogen and, uh, and eventually shorten that, that regulatory approval time down from, you know, a year to six months to three months and, be in a position where uh, we don't have to wait while people die, while you know a, a, a pathogen spreads worldwide, establishes many reservoirs, you know, of uh, of mutation uh, throughout the world, allowing you know subsequent uh, pathogens to become endemic in the population. Hopefully, we can get ahead of it to the point where that doesn't happen many more times, if at all again I'm trying to think of, of best ways to uh, to wrap this up to to summarize kind of what we do who we are and, and uh where we're going from here well i think everything we said um all of the sort of all of the reasons that we we started radvac um all of the the mechanisms that we put into place all of the the uh conceptual um the guidelines that we have for operating in the way we would, we, we do um, all, I think, boil down to one word, access. The trolley problem it highlights the, the real crux of why people were dying early in the pandemic, right? They did not have access to vaccines. Um, vaccines were made, uh, you know, Moderna, uh, BioNTech, Pfizer, they have reportedly they they reportedly had vaccines ready in the earliest days of the pandemic. Those vaccines are the exact same vaccines you're getting today from from Moderna and BioNTech, Pfizer. The exact same. They haven't changed at all. Um, the reason that you weren't allowed access is they had to go through this uh, this standard set of uh, hoops that they or you know or hurdles that they had to jump over, right? Um, so access was really a, the, the, the crux of the problem and, and we are trying to, uh, maximize access with everything we do. We're trying to expand access at the beginning of a pandemic when nobody has vaccines. And then we're also trying to increase access throughout the pandemic when some people, some geographies, some countries don't have access to vaccines. Uh, so that's the, the, those are all sort of the critical elements of what we're, you know, we boil down to one word uh, that we're trying to improve in, you know, in the current trajectory of this pandemic and the next one and the next one, you know, to in those periods where people, you know, would love to take vaccines, but just don't have them either through regulatory restrictions 
or through the incapacity of their country to produce a vaccine or robust cold chain for the you know for the shipping uh, distribution of the mRNA vaccines. There are lots of different reasons that people don't have access, and we're sort of working on all of those individual weaknesses of the system to try to improve access. I think that's a that's a great uh, point to emphasize and, and point to include in a summary. The you know the other thing is just to remind folks, RADVAC uh, is stands for the acronym does rapid deployment vaccine collaborative, and so it has all those elements in it. It has a collaborative aspect, the rapid deployment, um, you know, emphasis, and the rapid deployment of course of course consists of the many things uh, we've discussed today. Uh, which is, you know, really ultimately aimed at revising the whole model of vaccine development in the world, uh, both, both the te- you know the testing as was most recently discussed with challenge trials to speed that part up because that takes the longest. In fact, uh, along with you know iteration and adaptability, so that when the virus changes so can we change the vaccine just as fast uh, so we don't have these long lags between uh, development of of uh, variants and our ability to catch up to them and so this you know so that the situation is not constantly out of control rather we can get ahead of it yeah and we've we've um you know we'll get into our our sort of approach to vaccine technology maybe uh you know or or vaccine candidates from a, a technical level on a, a different discussion. Um, but uh, I think one, one point to bring up that, that is important, um, even in the, you know, the earliest introductory phase that we've been working on, um, you know, pan coronavirus vaccines or, or multivalent coronavirus vaccines for, uh, I, I think, probably more than a year now um, that, uh, you know, that our group is, uh, is targeting highly conserved epitopes uh, because we, you know, we were able to look backwards on sort of the the history of uh, of, of genetics um, for uh, for coronaviruses and, and anticipate the uh, the regions that uh, were most likely to mutate in, in variants going forward. And so, for for the platform, um, you know, that is able to adapt, uh, it's important that it be able to adapt to to new variants, but also that it's able to uh, incorporate these highly conserved elements as well. So that it's prepared for future uh, variants, um, and obviously in the news, uh, you know we've 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 just sort of seen the emergence of Omicron, uh, and in months from now, you know we might be looking at a, a very different new chapter of the pandemic. But um, you know it's clear that uh, that the the strategy that we've taken in our antigen selection, and obviously we've taken it, but we've shared it uh, through these these white papers, through these vaccine developer kits. That it is a, uh, a a resilient strategy for uh, for vaccine design, so I think that's that's important to mention too. So yeah, uh, uh, any any closing thoughts before we leave this one off for today? I know that there's so much more to talk about. I know that uh, we all uh, we all have have much to say um, about sort of the the state of affairs in in COVID nineteen and and in vaccine development and, and different ways that we're beginning to address those problems. Um, but, uh, but, but just as, you know, by way of introduction, um, I hope, I hope our, our listeners or watchers are, are beginning to understand what RADVAC is doing and, and why we're doing it and, uh, and, and where we're going from here. I think this was a great first, uh, episode or set of vignettes. Um, I look forward to the next one. Right. Me too. Yeah, so we covered a lot that. of ground. I, yeah. I, yeah. maybe it's, maybe it's two episodes. It might be. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Much appreciated. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, of course. Well done.